This lecture covers linear viscoelasticity part one for polymer rheology and processing. So we've touched on this before, but to redefine, viscoelastic behavior is a simultaneous existence of viscous and elastic properties within a material. And there's a lot of things we have to take into account for that, but um, one is paying attention to time scale. The assumption we make is that all real materials are indeed viscoelastic. Um, they exhibit both viscous and elastic properties uh, demonstrated uh, over one or multiple time scales. The time itself uh, is something we have to always keep in mind. There's the time scale of our experiment versus the natural time of the material, and that's something that's indicated by Debra number. When we're talking about time scales, uh, we need to think about the relative speed of the experiment. If the experiment is slow, the sample will appear viscous rather than elastic. If the experiment is fast, uh, the sample will appear elastic rather than viscous. And we're dealing with intermediate time scales, we get a mixed response, or both viscous and elastic behavior, and that's our viscoelastic rheological response. Um, it's preferable to assume that all materials are viscoelastic. Then, we ascribe Newtonian or viscous behavior in a particular situation, or we ascribe Hookean or elastic behavior in another particular situation. Uh, the reasons for studying linear viscoelastic response uh, are many. Uh, one is elucidating the molecular structure of a material from a linear viscoelastic re response. Materials and parameters, uh, material parameters and functions uh, measured sometimes prove useful in industrial quality control scenarios. If your response changes, that typically means your material has also changed. Also, a background in linear viscoelasticity is helpful uh, we, before proceeding to the more difficult issue of nonlinear viscoelasticity. So just like we had to define what a solid was and what a liquid was before we could, and therefore what viscous was and what elastic was before we talk about viscoelastic, we have to understand what linear viscoelastic is before we start talking about nonlinear viscoelastic. When we're talking about uh, the meaning and the consequences of linearity and viscoelasticity, this is what we're driving at. The mathematical theory of linear viscoelasticity is based on the superposition principle. In other words, the strain or response at any time is directly proportional to the value of the initiating signal, or in other words, the stress. So if we double the stress, we double the strain. Uh, in linear theory of viscoelasticities, the differential equations themselves are linear. Coefficients of time differentials are constant. Constant are ma constants are material parameters and not allowed to change when the change in variables. So uh, viscosity and rigidity modulus don't change when we change things like the strain. Uh, here we have a uh, amorphous polymer and the uh, relationship of the uh, strain over time. So here we have a sample that's been stretched an arbitrary amount, uh, and we measure the stress required to maintain this particular strain. So here we have a polymer in a glassy region. We're pulling it through its glass transition. If we have a high molecular weight material or a cross-linked material, we get this rubbery plateau. If it is indeed just high molecular weight, we will start to see a failure. Um, if it is rubbery, we'll see this uh, uh, plateau continue all the way out. Low molecular weight tends to drop off quite easily after the glass transition. And that's a typical viscoelastic type response when you look at stress versus strain. Uh, viscosity depends on shear rate and time. Uh, when we're looking at constant stress, this is known as creep. And this is exhibits time-dependent strain. If we're looking at a constant strain experiment, this is known as relaxation or stress relaxation. This exhibits a time-dependent stress. Viscoelastic materials also exhibit the ability to recover when the applied stress is removed, and this is known as creep reversal. So, to put this in pictures, this is creep. So we have a deformation under a constant load as a function of time. So we have a polymer sample here under 5 pounds. And as time increases, we get an increased strain. Stress relaxation, uh, constant deformation experiment, in other, in other words, to keep the uh, strain constant, we have to lighten up the stress as we go over time. When we're looking at stress-strain curves, we, it helps to know what a purely elastic response looks like compared to a purely viscous response. So shown here, we have strain and stress. In a purely elastic response, we'll apply the stress 
And as the stress is held, it has this particular strain response. When we remove the stress, all of the strain goes away. In a purely viscous response, we'll apply a shear stress. And if we reach this point before permanent deformation, we remove the stress, it will recover. If we have permanent deformation, we will see the strain hold at this level. A mixed response or a viscoelastic response will show a mixture of creep and recovery. So we apply the stress, we get a creep response shown here, we remove the stress, and then we get stress relaxation or recovery. Past a certain point, we will actually see permanent deformation, so it won't recover all the way. Um, but you have a mixed response compared to purely elastic or pure, purely viscous in a viscoelastic material. The, we use a variety of mathematical, uh, or sorry, mechanical models to describe viscoelasticity. Uh, the first is a spring. This describes solid behavior, uh, like a hooky and spring. The next is a dash pot. This ref, uh, refers to viscous behavior of a Newtonian uh, viscous liquid. And then we start putting them in combination. If we have one uh, in series, we have a spring and a dash pot, and that's called the Maxwell model. If we have them in parallel, we have the Voigt or Kelvin model. So we have a spring and a dash pot next to one another in parallel. The simple model of a spring gives us elastic behavior as related to Hooke's law. So this is linear elastic behavior when we're looking at just a spring, which we've talked about numerous times, both in the introduction and when we're talking about elastic materials. But just to review, this is where we start to get into the mechanical models. This is, gives us viscous behavior, and we've seen this figure before. Uh, this is how it relates to the dash pot. So um, strain, uh, stress equals viscosity times the shear rate, and that's how it relates to the dash pot. So purely viscous behavior when we're talking about the dash pot. So as it relates to the figures we just saw, so we apply the stress, uh, there's a displacement. When the stress is removed, the displacement goes back. In the case of the dash pot, we apply a shear stress, and it, uh, the viscous uh, strain is observed. We remove the stress, and it relaxes back. So this is what produces a elastic type response, the spring, and this is what produces a viscous type response, the dash pot. Now we're trying to use these together to describe a viscoelastic response. So the Maxwell model is a simple model that uses springs and dash pots to model viscous and elastic behavior or viscoelastic behavior. And this is the spring and the dash pot in series. Typically a spring followed by a dash pot with a downward displacement. So uh, what this actually gives you when you apply a, str a stress is you get a viscous deformation uh, followed by uh, this particular behavior here. So this is what real viscoelastic behavior looks like and this is what the Maxwell model can approximate. So it's not quite right, but it gets us closer to viscoelastic behavior than say a purely elastic or purely viscous response. This is the Maxwell stress relaxation model um, and uh, what this gives you is a relationship between viscosity uh, and relaxation time. So this produces curves like this over different regions of shear stress. And this is what uh, a model experiment would give you. So over this particular period of time, you'll get this curve. Over this particular period of time, you'll get this curve. Your real data will actually look something like this. So it doesn't quite fit the real data. So th it doesn't quite address the stress relaxation quite as well. Uh, this is the uh, differential equation that describes it. In this case, alpha 1 and beta 1 are the only non-zero material parameters, so that gives us this, where you have shear rate uh, is related to viscosity versus shear stress, and that's um, where alpha 1 is Tm and beta 1 is viscosity. If we, if we apply a particular strain rate, is applied at T equals 0 and held at that value, we can show this particular type of relationship. Um, upon the startup of shear, the stress growth is delayed, and there's a time constant here, which is tau m. If the strain rate had a constant value uh, for uh, the shear rate, and t is less than zero, uh, and that strain is removed, t equals zero, we can show that for t greater or equal than zero, we get this particular relationship. 
The stress relaxes exponentially from its equilibrium value to zero, and this is, relates tau m, and that relates it to be, being called relaxation time. So this is the delay of stress following cessation of steady shear. So this shows this particular relaxation over time at where t equals zero and the shear uh, rate is equal is uh, Newtonian. When we're talking about the Maxwell model, uh, we have to keep in mind that the strain rates are additive. So the total rate of shear is the sum of the shear of the two elements. So we have shear rate here is equal to the shear rate of the elastic plus the shear rate of the viscous, where shear rate of elastic is equal to sh uh, shear stress over, over viscosity. Shear rate of the elastic is the shear stress over the uh, rigidity modulus. So that gives us this relationship for uh, the, the shear rate. Um, or strain. So shear stress divided in, in the, of, of the elastic by rigidity, shear stress of the viscous divided by viscosity. So when we arrange that, we get this particular relationship where the tau sub m, or the relaxation time, has been written in for viscosity divided by the um, this rigidity modulus. This is the original equation where alpha 1 was stress relaxation and beta 1 was viscosity. That concludes the part 1 of linear viscoelastic responses. Next we'll move to uh, viscoelastic responses part 2 where we talk about the Voigt model and other exceptions. Thank you.